Joining us now via telephone, Congressman Trey Gowdy, Chairman of the House Select Committee on Benghazi. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Now, Trey, we heard Hillary Clinton yesterday, and in the wake of that, you say you want her to testify before your committee in mid-April. How realistic is that timetable? Well, we, we definitely have to talk. We always had to talk to her about Benghazi, uh, clearly, because she was Secretary of State, and, and I think people thought that that was reasonable, and they expected it. What nobody could have foreseen, I would argue, um, it was the arrangement that she had with herself uh, for the keeping of what are public records. So that added another variable which has to be explored, and it has to be explored on a number of levels, whether it is the Benghazi Committee or whether it is another committee of Congress, it does not matter to me. I am not looking to enlarge my jurisdiction. Um, I'm just looking for those questions to be answered so we can satisfy ourselves before we move to the second tranche, which is actually Benghazi. Well, mindful of that, Trey, you are a former prosecutor, and just to hear the former Secretary of State yesterday, did you hear some glaring inconsistencies in what she told the press? Well, there would certainly be some follow-up questions if I if I had been in the room. Um, I, I the the whole you know if you take them in chronological order, the whole notion that it was done for convenience. Um, I, I'm not an expert on on cell phone technology, but I can tell you in 2010, um, I was able to put two email accounts on one BlackBerry. Uh, and the president, who's a really, really busy guy, uh, manages to comply with the Records Act uh, using a BlackBerry. So the convenient, I mean, to me, what is inconvenient is setting up your own server. It'd be much easier to carry another phone or, or heaven forbid, have two email addresses on on one. But, but what really caught my attention is when she said, we, we went through the documents and sorted out what was public and private. Who is we? And and if you're talking about your lawyer doing it, how can we have any assurance that your lawyer negotiated or resolved or reconciled any close questions in favor of the public as opposed to his client, which would be you? So we had that assertion. You mentioned it. I don't know if we'd call it the royal we or the pre-presidential we. Uh, but somebody you're convinced was with her going through those emails, deciding what to keep and what to delete. Well, I don't think, uh, I mean, she's a very distinguished uh, person with a very distinguished career, but I don't think she's an expert in, in the Federal Records Act. So someone had to be involved in the conversation to determine, you know, this is more public than personal. And I'll give you an example. I mean, let's assume that you emailed Secretary Clinton and said, look, uh, looking so forward to going to Chelsea's wedding, thank you for the invitation. If I catch you at the reception, I'd like to ask you about Paraguay and what's happening there. Is that personal or is that public? Or is it a mixture? And if it's a mixture, how do you resolve that? So after her appearance yesterday, the bottom line is you have questions other members of your select committee have questions and you want her to come to the hill and answer not once but probably twice well i i am more interested that that we get the answer sequence correctly i mean i cannot ask her about benghazi until there is a level of assurance that we have everything that we are legitimately entitled to with respect to benghazi and I want to make this point abundantly clear. I have zero interest in her yoga practice schedule, the color of the bridesmaid's dresses. None of that is my business. I don't want that. But I do want everything that I am legitimately entitled to with respect to Libya and Benghazi. And the media has requests that were outstanding, and there are other committees. So it's, it's bigger than just our committee and what we want to ask her. And I, I can't ask her about Benghazi until I satisfy myself that we are in a position to have access to every document we're entitled to. Trey, as I understand it, the Associated Press has now sued the State Department. I'm interested in your perception of the cooperation you've received from the State Department, whether about these emails or other matters concerning Benghazi. Has the State Department been forthcoming, or is it a matter of you, with your, with your training as an attorney, 
asking the right questions for the right information. Well, I used to kind of smile uh, back in my old job when defense attorneys would, would tell the jury that their client cooperated. Uh, to me, truthfulness and honesty is a subset of cooperation. It doesn't help me at all for you to sit down and talk to me for an hour, but never once tell me that she didn't have a, a, a state.gov email account. Uh, you may consider that cooperative because you sat with me for an hour, but you didn't help me one iota. So the State Department, sure, they, they're willing to sit down with you and talk to you, and they'll give you their litany of reasons why they can't do what you've asked them to do. But the bottom line is they never once told us that she only used a personal email account, and they only told us the Friday before the New York Times broke the story that they didn't have her records that she had them. Back now on America's Forum to continue the conversation with Trey Gowdy. Trey is the chairman of the House Select Committee on Benghazi. And Trey, as a former prosecutor, I need to ask you about the possible criminality of Mrs. Clinton's use of personal email on a private server. Does your committee have jurisdiction over that? People used to stop me at the grocery store and say, why can't you put Lois Lerner in jail? And I'd say, look, that was my old job. <laughs> I can't put... I can't do any of that anymore. I'm in another branch of government, and, and I, I've got a, you know, I want other people to be rule followers. I have to be a rule follower, and I am limited by the rules of my branch of government, and frankly, I'm limited by the rules that set up my committee, which is why I'm, I can't ask about Iran or Bolivia or Uruguay. I can just ask about Libya and Benghazi, and, and, and I'm satisfied staying in my lane but, but there are broader equities here, as you pointed out, with the AP and other media and other committees. It is much broader than just the questions that I would like to ask Secretary Clinton. Well, let me follow up with, with this question, Trey, because there has been a question emerging in the press as to when exactly you and your committee knew of Mrs. Clinton's private email account. Can you take me through that timeline? Sure. Uh, we got a, a production or a batch of documents from the State Department in August of 2014. And we noticed in that production that there, I want to say there were eight emails, and they all had a private email account. Um, and obviously we took note of that, but, but lots of people use both their work account and their private account. So it, we, we made note of it, and we were interested in it. But we were mainly interested in the rest of the document. So we spent September and October and November talking to the State Department, not just about her documents, but a whole litany, access to witnesses. There are lots of issues in Benghazi. And so they never once told us, hey, look, we don't really have her emails. We're going to have to get them back from her. And what we've learned is they sent a letter and the other secretary, to the other secretaries of state in October and there was a production made back to the State Department. So fast forward to February, and oh, by the way, in, in December, we wrote her personal attorney, David Kendall, and said, look, can you help us with this personal email address? And he referred us back to the State Department. So, so we're thinking the whole time, well, well, the State Department has all these emails. We just got to hurry them up. They gave us another production in February. It was about 800 pages, but 300 emails all of them were personal accounts, no official account. It was when the New York Times broke their story is the first time that I learned that the only reason we're getting a personal account is because that's all she has. And, oh, by the way, she kept her records when she left the State Department. That never was shared with us by the State Department, despite multiple opportunities for them to do so. Well, Trey, this isn't your first rodeo, and you know how people have suspicions that things are held on to until a more propitious time politically. So again, just so I understand, it was the New York Times article that first notified you. You weren't holding that, that uh, email knowledge in abeyance until we got closer to calendar year 2016. No, the thing that I am proudest of of folks that I work with is, and I told them on day one, serious investigations do not leak, and they do not make selective releases. Uh, so, yeah, there has been criticism that, you know, I should have done something in August of 2014 when I had a whopping eight emails from a personal account. 
Uh, but but what that does is it feeds the narrative that this is a political exercise and not a serious investigation. And I did not sign up for a political exercise. I signed up to try to bring some comfort and some justice to my fellow citizens and four people who were murdered. So I take this very seriously, and I don't like leaks, and I don't like selective releases. And the New York Times uh, knows full well no one on our committee was the source of that information. I learned it when I read the story. Um, did I know she had a personal email account? Absolutely. Did I know that's all she had? Did I know that the State Department didn't have all of her records until she gave them back? Not until I read Mr. Schmidt's article. He's got better sources at the State Department than I do. Chairman Gowdy, before we close out, give me a timeline. What do you expect next in your investigation and in terms of calling Mrs. Clinton before your committee. You sticking to that mid-April date? Well, I, I, I hope so, but, 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 but in candor, you know, the power to subpoena is only as good as the power to, to compel compliance. And, and, and I, I, I'm not in the executive branch. I, 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 I don't have any mechanisms for compelling compliance other than contempt of court. So, which, which we tried with Holder, and we're still in court. I, no one wants to go there. I, I made a very reasonable request. Turn the ser server over to an independent, neutral, detached third party. Let that person determine what's personal, what's public. Let that person determine what's related to Benghazi and Libya. You keep all the rest of it, Mr. Neutral Referee or Mrs. Neutral Referee. Just give me what I'm entitled to. I do need to talk to her about how she handled records before I talk to her about Benghazi. But as soon as those conversations can take place, I would be thrilled to have her before the committee, and we can ask her the questions we have, and we will continue interviewing eyewitnesses, and we will continue interviewing other principals and witnesses with respect to Libya, and we're going to write a really good report at the end of our investigation. How quickly she comes and goes from Capitol Hill is frankly solely in her power. Just help me understand this. You touched on it briefly, but I want to make sure I understand. If push comes to shove, will you issue formal subpoenas to former Secretary Clinton? Well, of course. I mean, you have to. I mean, if you're if you're you hate that it gets to that point, um, you ought to be able to make a request of a former cabinet level official. You shouldn't have to resort to legal process, but. Certainly, the, the committee can subpoena people and can subpoena documents. The committee cannot subpoena, our committee cannot subpoena personal property like cars and boats and servers. But, but yes, we need to talk to her, and, and I plan on talking to her, and I hope it will be, uh, I hope it's something that we can work out with her lawyer. Uh, but if we cannot, I cannot do the job that I was asked to do with respect to Benghazi and Libya without talking to the Secretary of State at the time. Congressman Trey Gowdy, we thank you for talking to us on America's Forum. Yes, obviously, sir. Thank you. Obviously a story we will continue to follow back here on the Anchor Desk with Miranda Khan. The other developing story warrants our attention. And uh, we also have via Skype, Newsmax Managing Editor Alina Hernandez. We're talking about the two cops shot very early this morning in Ferguson, Missouri. Alina, I know you've been monitoring the Internet. What's the latest as the managing editor of Newsmax.com that you have for us? Well, it looks like there's going to be a morning press conference here shortly. Uh, we're expecting to hear a little bit more detail of what the police think happened last night. Um, there's some comments from some of the protesters who said that the shots weren't fired from the crowd, but instead from a grassy, like a grassy knoll, grassy area, uh, some distance from the police department. So it'll be interesting to see if the police have had time to review any kind of surveillance video, any kind of um, uh, witness accounts, and they, they potentially could determine if they've got an ID on, on who the shooter was. Alina, we think you. Shooters were. That's yeah. correct, because it could be more than one. Uh, the situation we continue to follow. Alina, thanks for monitoring the internet and the other developments. And again, that press conference happening at, at 10, 10 o'clock. Right. We're going to keep our eyes on it, and we'll give you the very latest information right here on Newsmax TV. And in fact, we could very well be going to that live as it as it unfolds. Right now, we're going to return to Washington after the break. My old colleagues, Pete Hoekstra and David McIntosh, will join the conversation.